Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? You're listening to Film Spotting. My name is Eric Ingram, and here with you. me is Michael Kester. This is um, so this isn't actually a voiceover gimmick. This is how I'm going to sound for the rest right. of the show. I'm not sure what's happening inside my body right now, but it feels pretty awful. However, that will not stop me it's from too talking much testosterone, about testosterone, right? Yeah, maybe that's it. Uh, two fucking movies. We went out to the movies this week. We did. We took some people. We went out. It was a great time. We went to midnight showings. Yeah, two of them. Two of them. I guess we shouldn't say this week because Expendables came out. Can you even see that in theaters right now? Oh yeah, totally. Okay, good theaters. So, so that's one of the uh, that's one of the movies. But uh, what are the two movies? We're doing the Expendables and Machete. Two films that even uh, deathly sick, ill will not keep you away from. That's right. So uh, we kind of figured after Cold Souls. Cold Souls. And uh, what was that other thing? Eternal something. Eternal something of the uh, spotless. spotless. What? Yeah, after those things, that uh, it might be a time to step away from the the heady philosophical nonsense mm-hmm. and do two fucking action films. And right. of course, one of them just has to be a Robert Rodriguez and film. And the other has to be Sly Stallone. We did the Rambo stuff. We did. We're always doing. Well, we the, did a Rambo stuff. We did the Rambo stuff, sir. Touche. And uh, we're, we're always doing the Rodriguez stuff. So um, I think we're going to be a little less Rodriguez-centric on yeah. this one. Or Robert Rodriguez, anyways. There's still like... Five other fucking Rodriguez's I want to talk about in this movie. And uh, Stallone, these are both going to be kind of cast movies. Yep. A lot of weird cast stuff to talk about. Well, it's ensemble casting. Yeah, I guess that's the the film title for what this podcast is about today. Well, and you would normally say that with a a Rodriguez movie, but this isn't his usual cast at all. It's uh, basically the people from the original trailer. That's his usual cast. And then everybody else is kind of somebody weird and you don't know how they got there. So we're going to spoil those movies, I think. Yeah, we'll if spoil If you don't them. know who's in the movie, apparently, we're going to spoil that about it. If you just want to skip over the movie you haven't seen, you can use the chapters embedded inside the show. So uh, we're going to do The Expendables first. Do The Expendables first. It came out first. It makes sense to do that first. There's no way we're going to spoil that, right? No, we'll, we'll spoil it. You think so? Oh, I'm going to make sure of it. All right. So if you haven't seen The Expendables and, uh, and then you listen to the show... You would be upset that we spoiled the movies. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, unless you utilize our chapters. Great, I think that's sufficiently covered. Something else kind of going on weird in here. Since the last time we recorded, we have uh, auctioned off all of the furniture for the studio. Yep. In a desperate attempt to uh, raise money for the show, we are sitting on boxes mm-hmm. in here. You are about um, three feet below where your microphone is. That's right. So Expendables is a movie that normally I don't know if we would do on the show. If it was just, uh, let's say something from the back catalog, right? Sure. If it was the 80s movie that it, mm-hmm. it sort of, it is an 80s movie. It, it just so of. happens to come out, you know. I think we, now, could, we but, should have that conversation a little bit later in the show because yeah. I've been reading a lot of people that say, I think the, the, the quote that actually drove me up the wall is the Expendables is not up to 80s standards. Oh, really? And first off, fuck you. Secondly, I don't know exactly what people hold as an 80s standard, yeah, but there's not enough torsos in the 80s? blowing off in the 80s. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's another weird thing and why we hate these fucking, the movies just came out shows, but come on, we have to talk about Machete, right? Yeah. And we had to pair that with The Expendables, so uh, it's just a show that has to happen. But then you, you see all the stuff that comes out about the movies, you know, referencing uh, The Expendables as an 80s flick. And then using your kitschy little title and your review of it not living up to the 80s standard, as if that even makes yeah. any sense. But I kind of wanted to talk about the movies fresh when they came out, not just so we have an excuse to see the movies, because all we fucking do is work on this show and don't have time to actually go to new movies when they come out. I shouldn't say that, actually. You go to a lot of new movies, I go don't to you? Pr- I go to a midnight showing just about every week. Yeah, at least I've you started see a lot to. of those. Right, yeah, I, right. I, try to, I try to... Well, you know, I gotta, I gotta keep hip to these young kids right. who are coming back telling me that what Resident Evil Afterlife in 3D4 right. is the bee's knees. I don't go out to see a lot of movies, but, uh, you know, when I go to see stuff occasionally... It, Inception's a really good example of something I saw fairly recently that came out. You know, in the last couple of months, I've probably seen three or four movies that have actually come out. And when a movie like Inception comes out, everybody has their fucking take on that movie, right? 
literally every person you talk to, they want to say something about Inception. Usually that it's so good and they'll offer to explain it to you. Mm -hmm. That's what I found about it. I don't, have you seen Inception yet? Oh yeah. Inception's a pretty simple movie, right? Yep. It's not complicated. Not really. It's not a huge, massive... J- no. I would say it's easier prestige to understand level. Than, yeah. Maybe yeah. maybe a little lower than prestige <laughs> yeah, level. Right, right. But everyone wants to explain it to you as if... you know, And you see all these diagrams around the internet, yeah. right? Like, here's Inception explained using X, Y, or Z method, as if Inception's really hard and mm-hmm. needs explaining. And so every fucking person you know talks about Inception. A movie like The Expendables comes out... And uh, no one talks about that movie. Things blow up, movie good. Yeah, and here, uh, you know, here we are just a couple weeks after The Expendables has come out, and uh, I haven't heard the term The Expendables out of anyone's mouth no. but yours, basically. Yeah, it's kind of sad. And I feel like the internet needs to continue to have a conversation about... Well, here's the thing, it doesn't need it. Uh-huh. Need is not the right word at all. Deserves. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. We just want to make sure, on in the marketplace here, there's still tons of people talking about Inception fucking nine months after that shit came out and uh what's it it's been like three months or something right it doesn't matter people still talking about that no one talking about the expendables so we just want to kind of push that out there just in case there's two or three people on the entire internet that feel like uh they don't have anybody to talk to about the expendables either so let's exploit the fact we actually went to the cinema we actually saw this and we actually uh had a bunch of people with us kind of just us at the yeah. theater that's true. Uh, that w- was that what you expected? That was a little weird to me. You know, I two things I think are strange about that. One is that The Expendables was the highest grossing film at the box office that right. week. Fuck sure. you, eat, pray, love. Yeah. Which was also, um, you know, that was something, too, that I didn't expect. I thought The Expendables would do well. I went to the, uh, the theater. We all went uh, to see the movie, and there weren't a lot of people there. And then I saw that it did, you know, seven times yeah. what the movie under it did. Exactly. That's where did we go to the wrong theater? I don't know. Maybe it's not a midnight showing thing. But the other thing that confuses me is that Scott Pilgrim that weekend was in third. Oh, yeah. That is strange, too. I saw it? Scott Pilgrim shit fucking a year in advance. Right, right. I read about The Expendables once and then saw a big poster where there were a bunch of muscly men holding guns. And then The Expendables was out the following week. Such a shit poster, too. The posters for uh, especially a movie like The Expendables should have been so much better. They went with the infinite white space blank. Here are all the people in the movie, which uh, we should. Let's get a drill down of the people that are in this film. We obviously have Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. All right. So we talked about a lot of Stallone stuff during the Rambo movie Mm -hmm. uh, when we did Rambo 4. Previously on Rambo is still one of my favorite bits of our entire show. So thank you for that. But there's a couple other names, and you have been conducting this this project for what seems like a year now yeah, it was a long to go time. back through and and before the Expendables comes out to see the complete work of a lot of these people, yeah. or at least to get a kind of feel. Of I wanted who they to are. familiarize myself with a lot of the guys in the movie because I mean, in the '80s, I wasn't watching movies too much. <laughs> no, not, not a lot so of that. many, not so many movies in the '80s. I wanted to make sure that I knew. And, and the thing that's weird is I knew more about Stallone than any of them. Right. And I didn't know shit about Jason Statham or Jet Li, the new guys, yeah. because I didn't watch action movies recently. And your action knowledge is mostly still from the 70s. Yeah, exactly. Or, in, or until this little excursion was. Yeah. So I backed up on my Dolph Lundgren, who's in the film, and then Jet Li and Jason Statham, which I already said. And then some of them you can't back up on. Randy right. Couture is a UFC fighter. Sure. Terry Crews is, he's new. I mean, he, he's not even an action guy. Yeah. He was a comedy guy. Mm-hmm. He's just big. And they needed <laughs> yeah. a black guy. Racist. Rather than starting the way the movie wants us to, with, uh, with talking about each of the individual main actors, let's talk about the people who weren't even on the fucking poster, who yeah. turned out to be the main people in the film. Yeah. Notably, Guy from Dexter. Yeah. So if we're going to look at this by screen time... The general, I mean, he's half of the movie. Sure. You know, scowling at the other yeah. characters with that yeah. excellent jaw thing that he does with right. his face. Right. Uh, doesn't even make it on sure. the poster. Right. Now, well, is that because he's not a name or is that... You know what I noticed is everybody on the poster got a badass moment. Right. And uh, he didn't really get a badass moment. Eric Roberts, who I would have put on the poster just because Eric Roberts is one of my favorite actors of all time. Awesome. And also, as far as a man's actor, he is the only suave man's actor who you're not chastised for actually <laughs> watching. Okay, okay. Um, no one will make fun of you for exactly. that. Exactly. But he, he didn't have a really badass moment. He was just kind of a jerk, but he had a lot of sweet, great lines. 
I think maybe that's it. Maybe if you didn't, if you weren't played up as who you were, maybe you didn't so much get a poster cred. When the poster was so misleading for me, it, it's weird we take a movie like The Expendables and now talk about the poster, right? We've spent our entire conversation talking about The movie's the cast. It. The poster's the cast. Yeah, this no, is the but right you're conversation. right. You're right. You're exactly right. But so I'm completely misled. I see this poster, and uh, I know you've been following all the stuff. You've been seeing every trailer. And I just kept saying to myself, well, I'm going to see the movie. I don't want to see anything about it. So I keep thinking The Expendables, all right? It's a, it's a team of, uh, I don't know, let's call them mercenaries. And they're going to go in and get the job done. Okay. So I, I think, all right, the expendables are the nine people on the poster, right. which is clearly not the case. Not at all. Those are just the people in the film. They themselves are not sure. the expendables. Sure. So already the movie has started and it's a complete curveball to me. Uh-huh. So that, that uh, gave me a lot of intrigue right there. Sure. It's just, oh, I don't actually know what the movie right. I came to see is about at all. Yeah. Well, they give you a couple on the poster. They give you two X expendables. Dolph Lundgren, who plays Gunner, and he kind of gets kicked out because he's a drunk and he's too big. But you you see him at least in the beginning of the sure. movie. He's, you know, he, the that is one of my favorite parts of the film, yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, what a way to fucking open a movie. It, just that initial shot, that first bit of gore you get. Um, something we talked a lot about on the, sure. the Rambo show, but Stallone's new stuff, I mean, he knows how to do that gore. And he knows the the right moment to start that. Um, we didn't talk a lot about that moment when we did talk about Rambo, but there's a, an early moment of gore in that as well that kind of tells you, all right, this is what you came to see. Yep. And uh, understands that really well. You get to that moment, there's that tension, and the first fucking shot literally rips the guy in half. Yeah, but the thing that I think is great as a staple of The Expendables versus something like Rambo, which we discussed as being a more serious kind of sure. less poster-esque violence, more about, you know, I guess Stallone said it was about the realism of the violence in whatever country. Burma. But what I think really makes The Expendables stand out with that thing in the beginning where the I, we keep saying this guy gets his torso ripped off, and I know that a lot of times we exaggerate, but watch the fucking movie, his torso hits the wall behind him. Yeah, that's him. it is that right before it, we have this kind of military standoff. Not a Mexican standoff where everybody's a badass. It's a military standoff where they have thrown in the money and they're sitting on top of this wall and they're trying to negotiate a hostage situation. And to show you that this is more of a fun, violent, action fucking flick, Dolph Lundgren leans over and says something along the lines of, okay, yeah, whatever, and shoots the guy's torso off as if, Okay, we don't want to deal with military standoffs. We want gore. Yeah, and that's your midnight movie moment. The first one where uh, people cheer, where you get that audible, oh my God, holy crap kind of moment. And uh, you were right earlier when you were talking about that. Every character gets at least one of those. And, you know, it's up to the audience to decide whether or not they get to, you know, be audible and, uh, and clap and applaud for that. But those moments are definitely there. We ran down a couple of the characters who uh, who aren't in The Expendables, not on the poster. I mean, Steve Austin, another one sure. who himself is not an Expendable. Sure, and Mickey Rourke is the other. Yeah, yeah, that's true, too. Although he's kind of over at that bar thing, motorcycle tattoo parlor. shop. It's always, a, it's always a bar, tattoo shop, motorcycle parlor. That's right. always what that place yeah. is. But Steve Austin first. So for the people who don't know him, and I think everybody knows Steve Austin, he was um, a huge figure in wrestling in what was that the late 90s or yeah. i guess early no that was that was about right the late 90s yeah. probably when wrestling at least in the united states was at its peak stone cold steve austin yeah was right name. right right and um the kind of thing that his his character in that had enough charisma to actually bring wrestling into the mainstream you know to popularize the entire um i don't even know i, I almost said the word sport but I think I would go more Show. with, uh, yeah, it really is. And there is, so I don't watch wrestling. I don't know a lot about wrestling, but um, I know a lot of people roll their eyes at it. And there's this carny kind of part of me that really appreciates sure. the yeah, sort of showmanship absolutely. of that. And I do like seeing a lot of these guys that come out of that um, format. They come out of, they come out of wrestling. They uh, come over into cinema or sometimes other places, which right. are kind of odd to see them pop up. And bring, you know, a lot of what they had there over into that. Steve Austin is somebody who 
you know, earlier in his acting career in a lot of the ways that, uh, say, Dwayne Johnson did, right? Mm-hmm. Dwayne Johnson, who, by the way, I noted when we went to the uh, the movies to see The Expendables, has actually been credited as just Dwayne Johnson and not Dwayne The Rock Johnson wow. on a poster. So he's made it, Michael. He's finally made it. But these guys come over and are central figures in movies a lot of times. When you look at uh, Steve Austin's role in The Expendables, it's more, he's this kind of mad dog. He uh, almost has a completely silent role, which is fucking weird, but he gets a lot of screen time and he's just kind of standing around. He's, uh, he's very, would stoic be the right word? I guess that's, uh, that's what you would use to describe yeah, somebody Yeah, like I guess. That. I don't know about he's just, stoic because he's kind of evil. But he's part of the scenery almost. Yeah. He's just the lead he's a thug pillar. every time. Yeah, pillar. Pillar is exactly the word. There you go. Pillar. And the few times he opens his mouth, I mean, that's one of the things that made, uh, you know, his character, I assume. I'm speaking now about something I know so little about. But if I can remember back to that era, remember to, um, to an actor, to a persona like Steve Austin, it's his voice. He has that gruff fucking voice that sounds nothing like any other voice you've ever heard. And the few times in the movie he opens his mouth, I mean, that makes his character well, there. Plus, he only says some of the most heinous, scary <laughs> things. Yeah, right. And it's never something along the lines of, I'm going to rip your throat out and feed it to a gerbil. Right. It's something along the lines of how he's not afraid to hit women. Right. <laughs> and that's scarier because it establishes him as a guy that just beats shit up. And that makes him scary because he's gigantic. The fact that that gigantic colossus over to the left of Eric Roberts throughout the film could snap at any moment and kill everything on the planet is a scary thought. Especially in a movie where everybody else's dialogue is very uh, cyclical, it's very tongue-in-cheek, they're kind of nodding and winking to each other, and then uh, as they're all laughing amidst the laughter, he says something like, I will beat women. And everyone kind of gets quiet and looks Where's at him and goes, the joke there? Why, why'd you do that, dude? That's kind, of a, kind of a bummer, man. But the dialogue is part of what makes this film distinct from something like Rambo or something like Stallone's more serious stuff. In that there's a lot of, uh, so I guess when people throw out the term 80s, that's what they mean. It's that kind of dialogue that's a little self-referential. And uh, you didn't get that in the 80s, but that's that refers back to a lot of these guys' careers or a lot of their stuff back in that uh, that time. But then also a lot of the zingers. I mean, that's what it is, right? Yeah. It's zingers. Sure. And it's that kind of dialogue that's supposed to be, that's supposed to uh, kind of induce eye rolls from the audience, force you to laugh because you have, it's, it's so awkward and cheesy that you have no other uh, mechanism for dealing with it. And to contrast that to, say, Steve Austin's dialogue just makes him look fucking nuts, like Dolph Lundgren. Well, and there's a brilliant mechanism throughout the film that some of the characters have their own storyline going, and that's what gives the film less of a let's beat up everything feel right. and gives it more of a, a, a film feel. You know, you have a plot, you have character development. Gunner's character uh-huh. gets kicked out of the Expendables, wants to get back into the Expendables. They turn him away. He ends up turning against him and then turns against the guys who he's sided with right, because right. it's just a blood feud at right. that point. And he has, you know, he has his badass moment and Jet Li has his badass moment. It's just stuff like that where there's just a rogue, you know, that's cast into the film gives the film a little bit more gravity than if it were just people, if it were just Terry Crews' character, right? Right. Who shows up with the giant fucking exploding shotgun and shoots everybody. He's the one who really doesn't have a background because he is in it to counterbalance all the other stuff that's going on. He's he's the the counterweight, which you wouldn't think you'd need in a film, but thank you, Sylvester Stallone, for making The Expendables a film that actually needs an action counterweight to all of the gravity that goes on. I get sick and then the show is just fucking all over the place. So that's completely on me at this point. Sorry about that. But uh, we didn't talk about Jason Statham at all, which the movie really wants us to talk about yeah. him because he's also half the screen time. Sure, It's a uh, guy from Dexter who plays the general, Sly Stallone, and then Jason Statham. Right. And they are the three people who are really in the mm-hmm. movie. Lee Christmas is the character name. Thank God you're on top of things here. This is another guy who I somehow know something about. And it, here's what turned me around on Jason Statham. And I know it's a, uh, it, it probably doesn't even have a lot to do with him. Or, um, or maybe it does. But uh, I saw, you know, I, I mentioned this on the show before. Our producer's ex-husband had uh, convinced me to watch The Transporter at some point. 
And I did that, and it was the worst fucking thing I ever. I hate no. the transporter. It was so bad. I do not it was get it. So very bad. And maybe some people like the transporter sure. and whatever. Maybe I just don't get I it. I really respect the director. The director yeah. choreographed all the fighting in The Expendables. Oh, really? Yeah. Corey uh, I wasn't aware of that at all. Corey Ewan, yeah. But you know what I did like? And I know you're not too into these movies, but I saw both, both, and that tells you how much I like the first one. I saw both of the Crank movies. Now, so I thought the Crank movies were just uh, terrible action films. I scoffed at them when they came out. And, you know, maybe they're not incredible action films. Maybe it's just the gimmicks that I really like. But I think the editing alone in those movies kind of makes them worth watching. You know what I mean? And that doesn't say a lot about Jason Statham, which is kind of sad. Because I wish I could just bring them out and say, you know, Jason Statham is so good in those movies, you have to see them. But uh, just the editing and the pace, yep. uh, they're fucking insane. The se- so you didn't see the second one? No. Oh, maybe should I? Maybe you should check out the second okay. one because there's definitely a kaiju scene. Yeah. There is definitely some Bill Carradine in it. Well, I know there's Dwight Yoakam. Dwight Yoakam's all over those movies. Yeah, the role of the doctor in those movies. And uh, the second one definitely has Bai Ling getting oh, hit shit. by a car. Spoiler oh. there. Whoops. Also lit on fire at some point. Another Damn. spoiler for the Crank movies. And in the second one, Mike Patton does the music. Oh my so God. had someone just laid this stuff out on a list for me, I would have seen the Crank movies when they fucking came out. But I had a really good time with those, and I'd probably sit down and watch them. That's how I judge a good action movie. Not that anyone gives a shit about my opinion of how I judge movies. But uh, if an action film is good, all I'm really looking for is that I would turn around and watch it again yeah. in a heartbeat. So is there anybody we didn't cover in this movie? Oh, there's a lot of people that the movie didn't cover. Oh, yeah. The movie builds the cast, and then it gives you the poster. And we'll talk about there's one name that didn't even make it onto the fucking poster that's Mm. probably the biggest deal. You're not talking about Jet Li. No. Jet Li is also in this movie. You have some Jet Li uh, history. He's... He's right behind Statham and Stallone yeah. as the, the next person in the Jet film, Lee, Jet Li's role is that he needs more money because yeah. he does more work. Um, Such an odd... I, I don't even know if I under... It's one of those jokes I laugh at because I don't get what the fuck yeah. is going on. But Jet Li is the emergent kung fu guy in the United States. Right. He's not Tony Ja, who is the emergent kung fu guy in the land of kung fu. And he's not Bruce Lee, who is the father of kung fu. He's not even related to Bruce Lee. It's L-I, not L-E-E. But he's good. And I think the reason that he is the forerunner in American Kung Fu is because he is more charismatic than Tony Ja, than a lot of people. Jet Li can act. Yeah, it's not just the martial arts. I mean, you like watching scenes with the guy. Exactly. You like waiting to see what he's going to say. He's done movies. He's did the one which I fucking... Oh, sorry, we're not a review show. I watched... <laughs> He did Hero, Uh which we already covered. Sure. We covered that with Black Dynamite. And one of his newer films, Fearless, which is actually a very serious film. And the the fighting scenes kind of take a back seat to what's going on there. Although it's a great film. I highly recommend watching Fearless to you. Okay. (laughs) But yeah, Jet Li is... It's interesting to throw a kung fu guy in with, you know, action guys and a UFC fighter. I think I mentioned Randy Couture. He's the UFC fighter. Terry Mm -hmm. Crews is in it. Eric Roberts... It's just a fucking ensemble cast of motherfuckers. In fact, it being an ensemble cast is the reason Kurt Russell didn't take Bruce Willis's role. Oh, really? Kurt Russell was supposed to take Bruce Willis's role. Actually, Arnold Schwarzenegger was supposed to take Bruce Willis's role. Arnold opted for the role he has in the film. Which is uh, almost the same as yeah, far it's, as... Yeah, it's um, the same as far as screen time. Yeah, which is kind of weird. Arnold not on the poster, Bruce Willis build on the poster, sure. despite the fact they have nearly identical screen sure. time. I didn't realize how much I missed Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, me neither. How much I liked Arnold. I don't even fucking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then I see him come on screen and I go, oh man, quit politics. Yep. Make some fucking movies. Yep. It was uh, probably the highlight of the whole film it for was me seeing great. him. And they kind of, he's got what, three lines? Yeah. And yeah. every line is just a nod to his past. Yeah, right. As if he's going, no, I've acted before. Remember me? <laughs> yeah. And everyone in the audience is like, we do remember you. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But he wants to be president. Yeah, just such a big piece of that spectacle. The whole thing, spectacle. That ending, you know, that ending scene, just, it, I mean, the movie's like watching fucking fireworks go off. It's what people think fireworks are, because fireworks themselves are not actually entertaining. Right. But to show up to that and expect a yeah. spectacle is uh, essentially what The Expendables is. And just uh, fucking Arnold Schwarzenegger. So give me a couple of these Dolph Lundgren movies, because I know you want to talk about this guy. Dolph Lundgren is my absolute favorite action star he's one of my absolute favorite actors yeah he was the original punisher 
from oh, yeah, the that's 80s right. version that's of right. the Punisher film. Sure. And something that I really respect him for is he's been getting a lot of offers to play in a lot of these new comic book movies. Not the Punisher, but right. say Iron Man or something, something Marvel's effect, sure. doing. And he's said, and, and after reading this, it's kind of changed my view on these comic book movies. And it says something about his role in The Expendables, too. He turns them down because he feels like comic book movies are all kid fun stuff where people dance around in colorful suits. <laughs> and that's so fucking true. And it's so heartbreaking to realize that Dolph Lundgren doesn't do comic book movies because they're not badass enough. Right, right. They're for kids. And right. he feels like some. that's why he did The Punisher. That's why that was the, the comic book he went for and why it was the version it was. Is that The Punisher's dark. The We're Punisher, not talking about The Punisher we talked about on the right, show, exactly. right? It's the 80s. That was the Thomas Jane Punisher. Yeah. This is a completely different world of it, Punisher. It's it's the real world. It's as if Punisher were in our universe. Yeah. He's killing people. He's not getting vengeance. He's not punishing. He's just killing people. Right. That's what's going on. And it just so happens he's killing bad people, but it's put in a universe where killing people is killing people, bad or good, and you have to go and say... Maybe that's not okay, <laughs> right? Even though he's wiping out the bad guys, and I really respect him as an actor for abandoning these new comic book movies and saying something like The Expendables is where the real heroes come in, because they're in a gray area. A true hero needs to be walking the line between good guy and bad guy right. in in the real world, sure, because they're going to be killing, right. they're going to be taking people's lives. And you have to wonder whether or not their cause is a righteous enough cause to justify killing, which it's not. There is no, that's not a cause. You can't have that <laughs> right. cause. But that's what the film even asks. The film asks, are the Expendables really the good guys? And Dolph Lundgren has always done film roles, except for Masters of the Universe, where he's He-Man and he's clearly the good guy. Whoa. Other than that, never the great shining hero. He's always the goodest guy. Our heroes often have to walk a line like that or make a hard choice. The Expendables, I mean, if this is a movie about something, and we haven't discussed the plot as we didn't do, again, to look back at Rambo, because there's not a lot for... How would you describe the plot? Give me a, a one-sentence plot of this film. Bunch of guys, political coup, everything blows up. <laughs> yeah, you didn't even need a full sentence for that. But if there's a point to the movie... And uh, something Stallone's good at when he writes this stuff or uh, on a movie like Expendables where he's just kind of putting it together as a director, acting in it. It's a movie about, you know, saving your soul, but not the soul in the, the Paul Giamatti kind of way that we talked right. about, but like the actual soul, your, uh, your humanity, sure. I guess, right? When you start doing this job and you forget why or, uh, you know, that's the whole reason they save the woman. That's why they go back. And that movie, you know, The Expendables stays true to that even through the end. That's the reason why, you know, they get to that moment in the end where the two of them are together and they're, you know, he's about to go back or whatever and they could totally kiss. That's the, like, the sure. fucking stupid that kiss moment the in the... That would be the 80s standard. And they don't because that's not what the movie's about. It's yeah. not about his love for this fucking also, woman over here. Also, he's 62 and she's like 20. <laughs> well, that, Turns out, I don't think that would stop. Sylvester the... Stallone is 62. Yeah, can you believe that or shit? He's something around 62. Don't quote me on his age. But he's he's over 60 and he runs faster than anybody I've ever seen. So they have these conversations. Mickey Rourke does some serious acting because right. that have, that's kind of the formula of the movie too is things blow up. Mickey Rourke does some acting. Some more things blow up. We check back in with Mickey Rourke. He does some more acting and then we come back around to him mm -hmm. at the end. But all of the conversations they have together, him and Stallone, are furthering that idea of we have to kind of maintain our humanity. I mean, that seems to be why Mickey Rourke's character isn't doing this anymore. Right. And the movie stays true to that through the, through the whole fucking thing, even at that moment at the end where it would have been so easy just to fall into the trap of, hey, save the day, save the girl, you know, kiss the girl and then the credits roll. And Stallone remembers what the movie's about, right. so he says, fuck that. So there's one other actor who didn't make it into The Expendables because he was in Machete. Um, yeah, it was supposed to be uh, Jessica. Wait, no, I don't think that Steven Seagal. Sorry, right. I get them confused because of the ponytails. Um, so Steven Seagal turns down The Expendables for Machete. Uh -huh. A fine choice, I think. A Absolutely. fine choice. Absolutely. Turns out Steven Seagal isn't a bad actor. No. Really hard to kill. Sure. Not a bad actor. Is that a 2%er you just threw out there? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I hope it's not more than 2%. So we go to see this movie, and I have to uh, I have to talk about this a little bit, but goddamn, are we going to get into Machete? 
Um, we saw this one at Showplace Icon, yes, this did. theater in Chicago, and we wouldn't fucking be a, a podcast about movies if we didn't talk about shit like this True. when it happened. Um, way back when we were doing, I think this film is not yet rated. I was evangelizing the Music Box as a you know support a theater that's doing interesting stuff. So Showplace is only in Chicago and I think Missouri, St. Louis. St. Louis. Louis, yeah. Louis is where it's at, and uh, it's this new concept theater. And basically, the rundown is. Um, you know, I was going to say deluxe ticket price, you pay more for a ticket, but it turns out because everything is fucking expensive that it's the same price for tickets. Yeah, it's like another 50 What do we pay, 12 50 or something? It's another 50 cents on top of what a normal theater... What I I was kind of describing it as to people Mm -hmm. when they were, why are we going all the way over here? My response is basically, we're not going to a movie, we're having a night at the cinema. Yeah, there you go. One of those crazy theaters where you can buy a glass of beer and take it into the uh, the movie with you. The whole thing, first of all, is reserved seating. I'm going to try and list off what makes the experience better in order. So you have reserved seating, which basically means we can go to a midnight show and show up there at 11.55. You know, what we can't do is show up at 12.01 because after the movie fucking starts, no one can go in. So you don't have all these people fucking rumbling and ruining the beginning of the movie. Also, they make it very, very hard for children to get in. So a lot of the shows are, uh, you know, after 7 p.m. or whatever, no children admitted, or you have to pay adult prices for infants. So if you bring a squealing baby at 2 p.m., you have to pay an adult price for the baby. It's really funny. If you read the reviews for the theater, just go on uh, Google Maps and type in Showplace Icon in Chicago or whatever, trying to find that. The reviews are all, you know, one star for this theater. They made me pay for my baby. Won't somebody please just think like, of the children? Yeah, somebody please think of the children. It's just review after review of, oh, my, they wouldn't let me bring in my baby and I had to pay full price. How dare they? This is America. Awful. But they also have a lounge in the theater. That's true. So the only people hanging out at the theater are the people in the lounge. Because there aren't just a bunch of kids loitering about waiting for their movie to start in an hour and a half who want to get good seats because you reserve your fucking seat online. So people like us who've been planning to see Machete for what? three years Mm -hmm. is that about two and a half years yeah uh so we had our seats in advance so we could just walk and sit down which is awesome i won't go on and on about showplace because frankly if you don't live in either of these two places you probably don't give a shit about it but uh i was at a point where i was ready to swear off going to movies and now i just go to this theater all the time it's lovely and i feel good actually paying to go see a movie so part of the experience of feeling good paying to go see something i'm supporting is that i want to drag other people to it So noticing that uh, when we went to the Expendables, we were the entire theater, and that was kind of sad. We brought, what, maybe 30 people to go see Machete? I think 30 people is actually about right. And we were the entire fucking theater. There there was one row, and I know this only because we had to deal with all the ticket reservation stuff when we got there and try and figure out who got what seats where. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were four, maybe five people in a row kind of behind us. And then there was a whole row of people you uh, bought tickets for and a whole row of people I bought tickets for. And we were the whole fucking theater, and it was awesome. It was such a good time. Nobody minded that I was that I'm the loudest clapper on the planet. No, and everybody cheered at everything yes, all the time. It was great. There was so much cheering. The people who created this film know when the the crowd pleaser moments are. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's something. If Rodriguez excels at anything, it's making crowd pleasing films. I mean, you would, you would probably agree that that's a good... If oh, I had yeah. to make a one-sentence synopsis of Robert Rodriguez... Spy Kids 4 now, please. That's the, right? I think you could boil it all down to crowd pleaser. It's not even a sentence again. And so everybody there knew who he was, knew who the actors were, knew the fucking studio. Troublemaker Studios, yep. the logo comes up, and people applaud. It was magnificent. And I got this moment, so we're all here. We're there with a bunch of friends. It's a midnight show. This is probably the most anticipated midnight show I've had since, uh, probably since Sin City came yeah, out. Yeah, since 2008 think, when fucking Grindhouse came yeah, out. Yeah, well, even Grindhouse, I went in there and I was kind of thinking, ah, Tarantino versus Rodriguez, how's this going to go? And now, so I knew that the original Grindhouse was fucking fantastic, right? Oh, yeah. I knew that the back-to-back was good and I had a good time. And uh, turns so, out we so, made an entire right. show about it. Right, right. So, uh, so we're here for Machete, and I'm thinking to myself, I've probably not been this excited to see a movie since you it, saw the trailer for Machete. Yeah, yeah, or even and, before. Well, and at that point, you don't even know that Machete is going to be uh, a movie. And I'm sitting there, and there is a moment uh, where it washes over me. This is really happening right now. I'm actually going to watch Machete, which is a real film. So, what brought us up to this well, moment? It started. It started way back as a twinkle in Robert Rodriguez's eye mm-hmm. or more a trailer in his eye. Yeah. 
Which, okay, so one of the crowning achievements of Machete the film and Machete the trailer, one, they got 90% of the actors to play in the film. Yeah. The Evalon sisters. Who are the producer's nieces, I believe. Yes. Crazy Babysitter twins Crazy from Planet Babysitter Terror. Twins. Yeah. Cheech Marin. Mm-hmm. And we get Jeff Fahey, yeah. who's briefly, his role from the trailer to the film is so, yeah, it's yeah. brought down because he is the guy in the trailer and he yeah. kind of become, he's better in the film, I yeah. think. But his role is kind of replaced by De Niro. Yeah. But the trailer not only keeps the actors from trailer to film, they lift scenes from the trailer and stick them right in the fucking movie. Yeah, because they're already shot, right? Yeah. I think that was what kind of convinced Rodriguez to make the movie. He sort of went, well, a lot of people would actually like to see this, and I've already shot like a fourth of it. He gets, I mean, there's the scene where he's discussing the whole thing. Septic is 250 in the limousine. Yeah, yeah. The exploding motorcycle. The making out with the wife and daughter. Right, right. All of these scenes from the... And it's great because apparently I've seen a trailer a million times. Yeah, I didn't realize that So either. when yeah. they came up in the movie, I was just excited. Yep. And, and on top of that, I knew the lines as if I had seen the movie yeah, before. Isn't God that has great? mercy. Oh. I don't. Yeah, and that's one of the things I want to talk about too, is that we've seen this trailer over and over. A trailer for a movie that uh, didn't exist. That's mm-hmm. how Machete started. It was a movie that didn't exist. It was just something to put into Grindhouse. And we're slowly seeing that all of these Grindhouse movie yep. trailers are kind of becoming their own films. And we're these ideas the BSS are... is getting pushed into maybe production. Yeah, there's a lot of maybes going on there. And then for a while, Eli Roth was doing trailer mm-hmm. trash, and now I was talking about a Thanksgiving thing. I don't think that Don't will ever be a film. Yeah, probably not. Although Hobo with a Shotgun went from a short to full length That's now, true. which is crazy. So everybody's realizing these were really good ideas and expanding on them. And when I started hearing about all this, especially with uh, something like Thanksgiving or Trailer Trash or whatever, I started thinking, well, now we're just stretching out ideas that probably there isn't enough there. And Machete was just a resounding, nope, not true, not true at all. So after seeing this trailer a million times, you get an expectation of what this film that doesn't exist might be like. How do you think that was different from what you actually saw in the theater? I mean, were you as you were watching this, were you going, yeah, this is... This is the uh, the machete I've built in my head, or was it kind of different for you? It was way different. Yeah. The two things that the trailer didn't tell me about the film mm-hmm. is one that it was going to be as political as it was. Oh which, yeah, yeah. Which I don't think it was overbearingly political because I kind of think all the politics was tongue in cheek. Yeah, yeah, right. But well, the, the thing- political trailers in the yeah, grindhouse exactly. voice. In the fucking women in cages voice. Yeah. Oh, perfect. But the other thing that I didn't really expect from the film, and that I think Robert Rodriguez has kind of always wanted to do, is, okay, I'm going to say this, guys, and you heard it here first, fucking choppies. Mexploitation. There you go. I didn't expect that from the film. I didn't expect a fucking motorcade of ghetto bouncing cars to right. roll up to a... I mean, I didn't expect things like that. I didn't expect a taco stand that was actually housing yeah. she. Yeah. Che Guevara with <laughs> yeah. its S instead of a C. That's all it yeah, is. Yeah, right, right. Con accento, I believe yeah. that is. Yes. And it's just, it's total mexploitation. And of course, Robert Rodriguez is, hey, welcome to mexploitation 2010. Right. Yeah. And he kept saying that too in all the press that he wanted to do, you know, since 93, I wanted Danny Trejo to be in his own mexploitation movie. And I just kept thinking, oh, yeah, exploitation. that'd be funny if that existed. And forgetting that that's what this movie would be, down to the fucking taco truck and the hydraulics on the cars re- and the gardening tools, yeah. the fucking gardening tools. Yeah. So I think that's where a lot of that immigration conversation was. But that's funny, too, if, if we can just take a second to kind of talk about that, because this came out at a time where, you know, the movie um, and, you know, a big applause to the production company for actually promoting this film. Yeah. I'm really happy that I'm seeing machete stuff around in the same way that that Grindhouse got that, too. Despite how Grindhouse performed and how they think Machete's going to perform, they're fucking promoting it anyways, which is beautiful. In fact, I saw the other day that they uh, promoted it at Comic-Con with a taco truck outside of Comic-Con. And Danny Trejo is there serving tacos, wow. which is pretty much the greatest thing that, that ever happened greatest in thing. cinema history. But so this comes at a time where it's actually getting news coverage for being controversial because we're in an election year in the United States and immigration is a big deal. So the fact that this movie uh, talks about immigration in the way it does or that they did the, uh, you know, the Arizona fake trailer that they did. So another piece of U.S. politics is that Arizona um, banned Mexicans this mm-hmm. year. 
uh, they did this thing, uh, the, this papers please law, where basically it says that a cop can stop you at any time if you look hella Mexican and ask you to show your proof of citizenship, which is the most fucking awful thing that's happened in recent memory in this whole goddamn well, country. And they, and they parody that in the fucking... That's the, yeah, the trailer they yeah. made. Yeah, <laughs> the Robert Rodriguez tequila trailer. But I love that I've been waiting for this movie for years, not even thinking about the immigration debate. Right. And then it just shows up like new controversial sure. movie talking about immigration yeah. as if that was the plan uh-huh. all along. And it, that, the timing just happens to be perfect with it, which probably helps the, the studio promote it. Yeah. It's probably one of the reasons, you know, when they're looking at their lineup of what movies do they have to pump cash into, they're going, oh, you know, it's, it's immigration time. Here's this uh, machete movie, which is so perfect for the exploitative nature of the film. Yeah. That's exactly what you want to happen. I mean, they couldn't have planned the fucking thing better. It's beautiful. And, and so the actual immigration issues are probably not worth talking about. Um, mostly just for the fact that, you know, the, the ignorance there is at such a high level, it would take people much smarter than right. us to sure. even, even begin yeah. to appeal to it. There's not a single person who, within the, the sound of my voice who I could try to make change right. their mind about immigration right. if they're a fucking idiot. So there's really no point in going there. To our non-American listeners, I guess, what, should we just briefly sum it up in a sentence? It seems to be the theme of the day. America hates Mexicans, its citizens don't. Yeah, there are unfortunately a lot of uh, Don Johnson-esque people. You know, the militia stuff you see in the movie, that's all actually happening in this country yeah. to a less theatrical, less cinematic degree. Uh, less Nash degree. Bridges. Less Nash Bridges degree. And it's pretty nausea-inducing. Uh, but what I've noticed since we've seen Machete just a couple fucking days ago, I guess two weeks ago or something, is that I can now watch news coverage where they're presenting both sides, you know, the people who realize that America is a nation of immigrants, and people who are fucking morons. And uh, they present those two sides equally. And I used to just, it turned my stomach. But now I just think about machete mm-hmm. when that stuff happens. And just You just no go way. buy a taco. You're right, just, I right. want a taco really bad Yeah, every right time, now. just do that. Every time you see that bullshit on the news, just go out to a local Mexican fucking taco stand and buy some. And do it like a drinking game. You turn on the TV, you see immigration shit, buy yourself a delicious taco. And now it's so reassuring to me because I thought it was just me and you. I thought we were the only rational people because that's what you, if you just watch the news and don't talk to real human beings, then you think with all the crazy shit going on that it's really that bad. But then you see something like Machete where clearly everyone in the movie thinks it's such a fucking joke that this is happening. The thing that's great about Machete is all the fucking immigration bullshit exists in a world where you can rappel down a wall on someone's intestines. Yeah, right. That's the universe yeah. that this immigration bullshit makes sense in. Right, so the resistance and even the physics of the world are heightened, but the people who think that immigration and the, the border should be closed and electrified fence, that's all real shit. That is all. They didn't heighten that at all. People really think that we should put an electrified fence on the border, make immigrants build it, and then kick them out of the country. That's the on- that's really a political platform. The only anything electric I'm really worried about in this film is Electra Avalon. So yeah, I'm right there with you thinking uh, that kind of stuff changed a bit from my perception of the trailer. But the other thing, and I was so scared about this because as each trailer comes out, it looks cleaner. Um, not gore-wise, but film-wise. And we still went with the the digital damage of Grindhouse. And it's such a fucking gimmick, but I love it so yeah. much. And just seeing all the deterioration and right in the beginning, just reminding me of Planet Terror, the way they would, you know, just cram on the sure. deterioration in the gory missing. scenes. Yeah, the scene missing kind of stuff. Although we never really got all the way up to that point. And I think the damage was lessened as the movie went on. Yeah. Although that could just be because I got used to it, which would be an obvious thing. But that was a huge relief. As soon as that happened, I was like, this movie, I don't care what it does. Yeah. Digital damage, you stuck with it. You didn't cop out at the last second. I'm right there with you. Uh, and it, if that doesn't get you, if the way the film is produced doesn't get you 90% of our audience, then maybe when Machete cuts everyone's head off in the yeah, first five right. minutes of in the, the film. In the first five minutes. Everybody's head gets cut off. Some people get their head cut off twice, as if that's even fucking possible. And then you go, okay... Well, thanks, Machete, for delivering the violence, but I was looking for sex. 
Yeah. So he walks in the room with a naked chick with a cell phone up her yeah, fucking Myra uh, Leal is the, the actress's name. The girl who, yeah, she's the double agent or whatever. Well, she's not a double agent because that would apply that you're an agent masquerading as an agent. Yeah. Where she was an agent masquerading as a naked chick. Yeah. With a cell phone in her pussy. Oh, the foley on that is really what makes that whole bit. If she'd just taken it out, it would have been a bad gag. Because it's one of those kind of things that seems like it's really explicit, but you don't see it. So it's totally safe. But the fact that it made that juicy, disgusting yeah, fucking sound sure. just, oh, it was so good. It and was then so that very good. The whole opening scene is topped off when Steven Seagal walks in <laughs> right. and cuts off Machete's <laughs> wife's head. Yeah, right. First off, before we even get to Steven Seagal, first thing he does is cuts off Machete's wife's head. Yeah. Just fucking on, um, just with a fucking samurai sword. <laughs> So completely relentless. We're having fun with the naked woman. Everybody's having a good time. There's a little gore. And then, oh, Machete, here's your wife. There goes her head. And then you realize it's Steven Seagal behind that impressive Mexican accent. Right. Is is the man who is harder to kill than anyone you have ever known. And he will take you to the bank. He will take you to the blood bank. So to the excitement of a lot of our listeners, uh, I guess we're going to talk a, a little bit less about Rodriguez this time because we covered him before and God damn it, we will cover him many a time again until every last one of those goddamn movies is on our show. We're looking at you spy kids and predators. But I want to spend a lot of time on the cast because it's so weird. It's so new. It's not the usual cast. So there's a couple roles that return. I know you spotted one because you talked to me about it at the time, but uh, there was another one too. So the one I'm talking about, of course. Spot the Spy Kid. The actor who played Junie from the Spy Kids series. He's also in... Daryl Sabara. Daryl Sabara the, yeah. from Spy Kids. Plays Junie in Spy Kids. He's also in another... Um, a remake of a really popular slasher film that's directed by one of the other Grindhouse directors. Right. Um, he, he's in that, too. He, he, so he, Daryl Sabara, the actor, is of Mexican descent. One may call him a Mexican. One may call him a Mexican. Or may get called out for calling him a Mexican. But apparently even the film acknowledges that he's a curly, red-haired, Irish-looking boy. <laughs> and so he gets the adoption line. Yeah, it was great. It felt like you're just talking to a friend about yeah. the movie. Because that's something everybody said about the guy. Uh, the, what about the other one? Did you catch the other obscure Rodriguez one? We have Carlos Guerrero, uh, Deputy Carlos, who is, you know, El Mariachi. Oh. Is, yeah, is one of the deputies. I didn't see who makes that a, Yeah, makes a small part oh. in this, too, yeah. Just another one of those. And then, you know, Cheech and uh, Trejo will get to. Sure. Jeff Fahey. Jeff Fahey counts. Je yeah, because Jeff Fahey was Planet Terror. Sure. Part of one of, and Jeff Fahey must have been so, you know, happy to have that Planet Terror role and then be kind of lucky, I guess, to, to pick this up because, you know, part of why he starred in the Machete trailer was this idea that these exploitation actors would all be in the same, you know... Sid Haig with Jack Hill. That's yeah, what it right. is. It's, it's Sid Haig in every Jack Hill movie. Yeah, so the same five the fucking actors. For just a yep, year. yep. And they would do all this stuff together. And then it turned out, you know, while they were shooting that, that's the real life exploitation element of Machete, is they filmed the Machete trailer using a bunch of actors that they kind of had on hand. And Jeff A was in Planet Terror, so come over and just do this Machete trailer real quick. And that lands him a whole huge role in the movie because, you know, he was in the trailer. And he's great. Yeah, and so that exploitation thing goes once again beyond just being a throwback, but really creating real-life exploitation production stories like that. There's a couple weird behind-the-scenes uh, roles, too. This was um, Robert Rodriguez directing... So, uh, you know, we've been trying to, well, when we saw Predators, that mm -hmm. was something that uh, we tried really hard to pretend Robert Rodriguez was directing, but and it wasn't. it was fucking good. Yeah, it was good. And, you know, even without him directing, the director, actually, of uh, Predators is in uh, Machete as well, has another bit part. But Ethan Menenkes is, um, who is on editing for a lot of Robert Rodriguez's films, also did some of the directing for this movie. And I think that's part of the, the quick method they tried to shoot this in. Because if I had to take a guess, the reason that uh, Robert Rodriguez didn't do Predators himself, didn't direct it himself, is because he was working on Machete at the same time. That goes back to that um, that kind of rumor that I don't know if this was ever confirmed, that the studio sort of agreed to Machete because he sort of agreed to Predators. So the Predators director played a bodyguard. But the one other one is, you know, so Ethan Menekes was in the editing department on all the o these other films. He's directing now. So the editor was Rebecca Rodriguez, 
who you will remember from the short film Bedhead. Yep. She is the psychic girl that stars in Bedhead. If you haven't seen Bedhead, it's an it's a eight or ten minute short. Just uh, check it out on YouTube or something. I'm sure you can find it. But she did the editing for the film, which I thought was awesome. And then um, Chingon, who I still can't pronounce properly because Chingon. my Spanish is terrible. Chingon, which I still can't pronounce properly because my Spanish is terrible, did all the music for the film. And the music is just so fucking yep. spot on. Just how easily it slides into the porno themes? music. Well, and the themes, themes throughout yeah, the it film. is. Yeah, there are themes in the in the film in the same way that Planet Terror had yep. those uh, those couple central themes. I don't know why I didn't see this one coming, but Tom Savini also yeah. shows up out of nowhere. Also, is, what is, is it? One eight hundred Hitman or something? Uh, yeah, something like that. He when plays we've, we've Osiris. Only... Yeah, right, right, right. This is. I think it feels intentional because I feel like Tom Savini's character should have died. Right. And I think this was Robert Rodriguez's apology for killing him <laughs> in every film he does with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. We've talked about it before that Rodriguez kills people, and yeah. he kills all his characters all the time. But this movies. time, this time he kind of he gets the upper hand. He gets to say, "No, he's coming after you." Yeah, and that's the last you see of him. Peace. I'm out of here. Um, and the Robert De Niro, Michelle Rodriguez. The fact that I just said Robert De Niro and Michelle Rodriguez in the same movie, yeah. both as central characters, sure. is still mind blowing to right. me. I will never get used to that. Jessica Alba, who was in Sin City, another uh, Troublemaker Studios film, I never really got Jessica Alba until this movie. Yeah. But she carries a lot of the weight of the movie, if there is weight. I guess there has to be weight to a movie yeah, like this. Sure. And she carries a lot of it, and she does a damn fine job of it. There's there's uh, scenes, especially towards the end, you know, where she's standing on the car and delivering her fucking ballsy speech. Mm-hmm. And not for a second do I ever go, ha ha, that's the invisible girl from those shitty Fantastic Four oh, movies. Yeah. I really do think, oh, Jessica Alba, she's the you cop. Not, I believe you, her you don't character. You look at her and go, oh yeah, Dark Angel, cool. I'll pretend I don't know what you're talking about, sir. Which gets me to the last name that we have to mention, and that's Danny fucking Trejo. Danny Trejo comes up on our show every other episode, every other I would episode, say. Yeah, he's, this, he's this guy, he's everywhere, but no one really knows mm-hmm. who he is. Or people do know who he is. Sure. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people about Danny Trejo. Have you kind of had that experience? Oh, yeah. yeah, sure. A lot of people know his name. Everybody knows his face. Right. He's got one of the weirdest acting backgrounds ever. Yeah. Because he's not an actor by trade. Mm. He's a... Well, he's a Mexican by what's trade. What's it called? What do you do before acting? Uh, he's an inmate by trade. <laughs> he was in prison for 11 years. Oh, my God. He comes out of prison. He was, you know, on drugs and he robbed somebody. Mm. And then he went to jail. And then he was somebody's sponsor for some drug program. Yeah. And they needed him, so they call him. He shows up to help them on the set of the film Runaway Train in 1985. And one of the other workers on the set recognizes him as a fellow inmate, you know, an ex-con buddy. And Trejo's been kind of paying the bills as a boxer. Mm. His ex-con buddy asks him to train one of the actors on set, who's Eric Roberts, which we talked about back in The Expendables. But Eric Roberts is like four years old right he's he's much older than four but he trains eric roberts for the role eric roberts is second build in the movie right under john voight and then one of the producers directors one of the people who has some pull in the film so it's got to be producers says hey you're doing a good job there you want to roll in the movie as a boxer yeah and they hand it to him and you know then robert rodriguez sees him picks him up for his flicks and that's where danny trejo started acting instead of being a fucking west side thug so you know he's in the mexico stuff and then uh like we mentioned rodriguez had this idea for a long time uh since desperado so he's got this um he's got essentially the same character sort of in desperado Mm -hmm. this knife wielding guy again in once upon a time in mexico but as we mentioned before in the spy kids films he's uncle machete uncle machete in the fucking spy kids films Finally, this comes to fruition, and I feel like the people I talk to now who know who Danny Trejo is, you know, yeah, he's getting a lot of work. He pops up in smaller roles everywhere, but finally he is the star of a film, and once again, as Rodriguez envisioned, people know his name now because he is Machete. Right. You know, all the people I talk to about Danny Trejo, they were either excited about Machete or they knew him from the trailer in uh, Planet Terror. Famously, the only trailer that made it out onto DVD yeah. when that shit got split up. And so Machete being a joke almost about, uh, you know, exploitation and how they're going to make Danny Trejo a ho- uh, household name and how he should star in his own flick. 
And then he does. He stars in a flick that's kind of a joke about that. And now people do know who Danny Trejo is. I mean, as far as Machete reaches, they know who Danny Trejo is. And it turns out you give the guy a starring role. And of course he can carry the whole fucking movie because he's Danny fucking Trejo. Because he's amazing and we love to watch him. And uh, I don't know why no one's done that before, but it's such an achievement. It's something to to really applaud and celebrate that finally it did happen. It got done. A studio led a movie with Danny Trejo in the lead out into the public. People have seen it now and it worked. Yes, it did. So we mentioned Steven Seagal. I keep making fun of Steven Seagal. I hated Steven Seagal until this film. Yeah. One thing that I really give credit to the film for, for doing and saying and giving it to Steven Seagal, because I feel like that was winking and nodding to probably me and the other people who have been getting my jokes throughout this show. Machete stabs him through the stomach. The end of any big action flick, you stab the bad guy in the stomach and they look down and they realize they're mortal. Yeah. But Steven Seagal, instead of realizing he's mortal and falling down and, and looking for some last words to say or hear to kind of make his life meaningful, he just looks down, he goes, you stabbed me. I could kill you right now. <laughs> You're disarmed. I could swing my sword and decapitate you very easily, but I'm not going to do this. In fact, I'm going to just sit here and let myself die. Furthermore, and he reaches in and kind of, you know, twist twists the blade, the blade right? and cuts yeah. himself some more just to prove that he's, I mean, he's serious. He's really difficult to kill. Yeah. And very hard. So he kind of gets to do the thing that I always think bad guys should do, which is fucking, oh, you stabbed me. Your sword's stuck in me. I can take you down with me, motherfucker. Yeah. He acknowledges it, but then dies like a bitch anyway. Thusly giving Machete the victory and confusing half the people in the audience. So I guess my advice to them then is see more Steven Seagal movies and uh, that moment will be very triumphant for you. I feel like we're leaving someone out. Mean Girls. Yeah, Mean Girls. I ranted on Mean Girls about what an incredible film it was, how it did important things, how it was uh, very important for its genre, and how I actually really adored Lindsay Lohan in it. I thought she fucking made that movie, although she's got a pretty good supporting cast for her, and didn't really do a lot since then. And now uh, here she is. It, she did a lot since then. Yeah. I'm, let, me, let me rephrase that. Didn't do a lot I gave a shit about since then. Her career kind of spiraled into obscurity just because she latched on to being a teen star and those movies are all dumb and boring. Right. And she also knew who killed her. She did know who killed her. I can't believe that was a movie. Thanks for reminding me all this shit, but this is a different direction for her. Let's say. Yeah. Well, I've always said, not always, but since she's kind of turned into Hollywood tramp, Lindsay Lohan, Yeah. which you know what? Honestly, you want to know how I feel about that? Yeah, I would like to know. I don't fucking care. Thank you. If an actor turns out that they're like doing heroin and having a lot of unprotected sex and then they act okay, (laughs) yeah, good for them. Yeah, right. Fucking whatever. You know what nailed that dead on? You remember that South Park episode, Britney's New Look? Yeah. Where they shotgun half her head off and no one can see past that. They they just keep talking about, you know, it's a big joke about when she shaved her head sure. or whatever, but she fucking shotgunned half her face off or someone else did it. And everybody's oblivious to it because, oh my God, what look, what, look at Britney's new look and look yeah. what she's become. And, oh, she's such a tramp and all that shit. Sure. That is how we really treat celebrities. And that's exactly what's going on to fucking Lindsay Lohan. Exactly. It's it ridiculous. Me nuts. Actors act for a living. Yeah. Imagine whatever you do for a living. Um, you know, podmanity, whatever you're doing for a living, driving a dump truck, cleaning up shit off train tracks. I, I don't know whatever you're doing. Working for the government if Think you're of- a woman. The, the men drive trucks and the women all work for the government. That's our listenership. Think of all the people you work with. Think of how little you'd care if they went home and fucking did some cocaine and had sex. Wouldn't care. And then came back to work the next day. Nope. If they told you, you would kind of nod. Oh. Yeah. Sounds like an eventful night. I had a TV dinner. Yeah. That's how I feel about acting. If you show up and do the fucking job, go home and get fucking piss drunk. <laughs> I, don't drive drunk. Please. Right. No, That's don't different. do that. Come on. But get piss drunk, take off your panties and fucking let dudes line up and lick your fucking vagina. For I five cents. Five cents a lick, care. I believe how that goes. And I think that Lindsay Lohan, since falling off the acting wagon, the respectable actress train, right. has turned into trash as a human being. Mm-hmm. 
why can't she just be a trash actor? Yeah. Why can't she act in exploitation films? Why yes. can't she show up and play the role of the druggy bitch under the table in a party scene? And she's and so very it. good at it. That would be an excellent, you know, child actors often have a hard time transitioning into adult roles. It's very awkward. People love to see them as children. They don't know who they are as adults. And very, very few of them uh, ever make it. Lindsay Lohan is clearly doing something perfect here, very different than her child stuff, divorcing herself from that, which is not the role apparently that is in demand for her, and uh, doing something like Machete, where she's just naked the whole fucking time, kind of plays an idiot, and it's just such a trashy, filthy role, and seeing her embrace that is so perfect. You know, I'm going to uh, I'm going to agree with you completely on that, um, the take on celebrity culture. And I'd go one further and say, you know, just as disgusted and entertained, entertained and disgusted as most people are with an actor like Lindsay Lohan, that's exactly how I feel about the people who spend their lives reading TMZ and that Mm -hmm. bullshit, that celebrity gossip stuff, thinking about, you know, how much better they are than those actors and look how they've fallen from grace and fallen out of the spotlight. How vapid and fucking empty does your life have to be? as a consumer of media, that you read shit like TMZ and criticize the lives of celebrities. Can we just make a kind of a counter magazine where we just criticize people who aren't working? If they're eating a gross burrito or something, (laughs) just like take a picture and ask them what they do for a living and put it up online. This postman is eating a burrito. Ew. You used to have steak for dinner. Look at you now. What would your ex-wife say? He's going to get bean sauce on my letters. This man could be delivering mail to your house. Christ, fuck off, people. I can't believe the the arrogance of some people. But whatever, I've defended Lindsay Lohan on two, count them now, two uh, podcasts. So that's as much as I can legally talk about Lindsay Lohan before just becoming another TMZ. God knows I wouldn't do that to our show. But naked and amazing and a nun and licking a revolver in this movie. And naked all the time, although it is a body double because we want to get our facts straight on yeah. double feature. Still awesome. And you can definitely see Lindsay Lohan naked on the internet. That's sure. not a difficult thing. So I just, I love nudity and I love that it's in machete and it makes me very happy. Can we go back to Myra's scene uh, early in the in the film? Sure. You know, that reminds me of- If we're talking of, nudity, why the is, fuck not? Is uh, Barbarella. Oh yeah. You start your exploitation film- with uh, a nude scene making people believe that there's actually a ridiculous amount of nudity in the film. If I remember correctly, the only nudity is Lindsay Lohan's body double. And um, her mom's body double. Right. <laughs> Lindsay Lohan's... Well, I think it's just Lindsay Lohan's mom okay. in the film. I her think that actress is mother. just... No, I don't oh, think that's true. either. the plays her mother. Okay. So our opening scene, the most nudity in there. A uh, brief shot of Machete making out with uh, the daughter and mother. The uh, shot of Lindsay Lohan, you know, before she puts on the nun uh-huh. stuff and laying in the truck, actually, yeah, I guess. Right. And then the shot of Jessica Alba, in where the they kind of painted out her clothes. Yeah. That's all the nudity in the movie. The most nudity is in the very beginning. But if you ask me if there's a lot of nudity in Machete, Everyone's I'd say, oh, fuck, all yeah. The time. Yeah, all the time. Thank you, Barbarella Method. <laughs> We're seeing it here at work once again. So if Machete's two things, it's nudity and weapons. Yeah. Well, and tacos, I guess. Yeah, tacos. Nudity, weapons, and tacos. That's the third time. But we, I'm getting so hungry. That's something we don't talk a whole lot about when we talk about the Troublemaker movies. But the weapons are always really interesting. You know, to think back to the uh, the Desperado gun, the the double barrel, which we kind of see again on... Um, it's it's one of She's weapons. That sounds really weird. She's... That's correct. Um, let me try... Uh, La Arma de She, does that sound, that does sound better, actually. Even when in my butchered Spanish, that sounds better. The weapons of She, it doesn't sound good in English, though. La Arma de She, we have the, the sawed-off hip shotgun yeah. thing, which is really fucking cool. But also, what the hell is that giant gun she steps off the truck it's a with? a super gun. Yeah, it's a, it's a fucking super gun. It looks like it's missing the barrel off the end. Or it maybe it's just a giant stapler. I don't know what, yeah, the, like a just, giant staple gun, right? That's what gun. it looked like. I yeah. expected it to yeah. shoot out a pulse beam or something. Sure. And it's shooting out bullets. Oh, just fucking amazing. The Halo reject is what it is. Oh, no, video game reference. One star. <laughs> Always interesting weapons. Uh, when we're not dealing with that, or the, you know, the titular machete, which is probably the best weapon. Sure. I mean, they make a bunch of jokes about it, but when the machete is on screen, 
I mean, Robert Rodriguez makes sure, one, he shoots Danny Trejo to look like a big fucking Mexican, which is hard when you're doing a whole movie with Trejo. But there's only uh, maybe two or three scenes of him walking through doors where he doesn't look like this giant guy. And uh, also to make the machete, the weapon, really the weapon. You really want to see Danny Trejo on screen with a machete because you know a wonderful time is about to ensue. Also, the uh, weird dagger medical things on the giant chain. I don't even know what that was, but when he's ripping apart people's faces on it, it's beautiful. And then, of course, the gardening tools, which are humorous, but also they kind of mix up the violence so it's not just hacking off limbs for an hour and a half. Because that would, after all, get boring. So we have these sections where he's using gardening tools. And it is. It's slapstick. You know, you're hitting somebody with a weed whacker. And when he had the weed whacker out, I'm like, this is going to be the goriest scene in the movie. And I forgot that a weed whacker would not... It's just a plastic... It's a plastic string on the end of a spinning dial. Right, right. And so the guy appears to be really, really annoyed by it. And it's one of the funnier scenes in the movie. I think the one of my favorite things about the weapons in the film is that... Machete shows up the second time to the same house with the super weed whacker with a bunch of spinning knives on it. Yeah. And all you ever see is him like hold it up to the guy who then quits and runs away. Yeah. And you never see it get used. Exploitation. God, I'm so glad this movie came out. Me I'm too. so glad this is a thing. I didn't know at first if Machete needed to be a real movie. That's probably never true. I always thought Machete needed to be a real movie. But I didn't think it would happen, you know? Yeah. And we might just be back in that era where you don't know Rodriguez is making movies and then they appear. I remember you telling me Machete was really happening back when there was press stuff for Predators. And I kept telling you that movie will not get made. That's because Sin City 2 happened, mm-hmm. right? Or it didn't happen. And so now every time I hear that a great movie's coming out, I think, well, Sin City 2 has been coming out for five fucking years where is it? And uh, and Machete did actually appear almost overnight. It just appeared. Yeah. It was made, it came out, and it was fucking amazing. And that just makes me so happy. Other thing we should announce really quick on the show, um, the Grindhouse DVD, Oh yeah, that's also a thing that's really going to exist. Can you believe that shit? No. So uh, we've made fun of this a million times, and I think it's coming up on a, uh, the Music Box show too. If I remember when I was mixing it, we made fun of it on there. But um, the Grindhouse double pack DVD thing where Planet Terror and uh, that thing Quentin Tarantino made, what was that called? Death Proof. Death Proof. They're actually in the same pack. And I could care less about that because it's the digital era. And uh, you know what? No, fuck that. You can put one DVD in after the other. It doesn't even matter that it's the digital era. You can make your own Grindhouse experience. That's fine. But I know they were holding a lot of stuff off the DVDs. Usually the Robert Rodriguez DVDs are packed. The fucking shorts DVD is packed and uh, didn't get a lot of stuff on the Planet Terror DVD. So that's coming out now and it's got the fucking cooking school. It's got all the behind the scenes stuff. It's got all of the fake trailers, every single one of them. And it's coming out in high definition as well. This day is finally upon us. I can't believe the things that are happening. This is literally the best time to be alive on planet Earth. Yeah, planet Earth earth what you got nothing to follow that another thing on planet earth is email <laughs> i'm just, i can't follow best <laughs> thing on planet earth no i know it's hard we have an email address double feature show at gmail.com uh if you live in chicago and you know a good taco place we could actually really oh. use that right now um send us an email about that and not just you know what not just a taco place don't fucking send us oh yeah i went to a taco place once it's down the street it's okay i mean a really good taco place Our studio still, our makeshift studio, we're still in our makeshift studio, by the way, haven't given an update on that. We're just borrowing shit from people. And furthermore, we're auctioning that shit off for our own purposes. We're signing it all. We're, I I don't know how. No, we can't. That would make it worth so much less. Yeah, it really would. What's this ink shit on here? (laughs) Does this wash off? Yeah. We should have done it through the show, but we actually just auctioned all that stuff off already, so we don't have it anymore. I don't know how much longer we're going to be able to do this here before we have to find another rat-infested hole to do our show in. <clears throat> but we do still have money for tacos, so uh, so let us know about that. We have a website as well for the show, doublefeatureshow.com. And um, is there anything else besides tacos, actually, that people should email us about? Um, you know, a lot of people just saw these movies because they came out in theaters. One, once again, we'd like to know, how do you feel about the whole movies just came out? We're going to do a show yeah. really quick with basically no preparation thing. Are you into that? Yeah. Do you like that? Should we never do this again? 
basically any feedback other than I'm tired of hearing sure. about Robert fucking Rodriguez. You can also email us. look us up on Facebook because that's how I usually read stuff. Oh, yeah. We do have a lot of people on Facebook like sending messages. Which is good. I read stuff. all that. Eric reads all that. We kind of try to sign who's talking. We kind of forget right. like half the time. Yeah, right. Usually if it's quick and kind of says the word fuck a lot, it's probably me. Um, I think goddamn appears more in mind. Yeah, that's goddamn is that's how we should just sign it from now on. Right. We'll sign it fuck or goddamn. All right, great. Speaking of uh, the rodent den, we're doing the donation thing. We are too. doing the donation. Thing. So remind me again, how the fuck did we do this? What's well, the thing? Okay, so here's the plan: is uh, if you donate, we're going to enter you into a raffle. Uh, raffles are gay, but we're gonna just call it a raffle. <laughs> the word raffle. Can we get a better word for that? Because raffle does sound like this is a musical. Gonna, you know, win tickets. We're to... gonna enter you in a Russian roulette. <laughs> okay. A type of. Uh, I like where you're going with this. Here, where Email us of, if you have a better word than raffle. By the way, um, continue. The winners of the raffle at the end of whenever will get to send us lists right. of films. So to, we're gonna pick out two people at the end of the year or mm-hmm. toward the end of the year. And each of you will send us a list of films, uh, however however many you fucking want. I don't send care. us fifty, send us two, whatever you want to send us. More than one. Right. We'll choose one film from list A and one film from list B and put it together so that it's not your fault when it sucks. Yeah, if it sucks, we don't have to blame the listeners. We can accept responsibility. Yeah, we're totally gonna just blame just our you. pairing. We if are. it sucks, we're gonna blame no, 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 you. You forgot producer. about this. Producer, blame the producer, man. We have to get back to that. We'll just blame the producer if things go wrong. But that'll She's be... She's got you sick, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You should what mention that. Fuck. Also, why did she sell all our furniture? That bitch. Okay, so that's not the only thing we're doing with donations, too. We got a subscribers thing as well. If you subscribe to the donation thing, it's on the website. You right. can find it. There's Donate.doublefeatureshow.com. You can send a one-time donation or a $5 a month kind of thing. At which point, we will let you do a little quippy, pithy intro line. Yeah. In the beginning of the show. That is going to be so good. I cannot wait to get those. So I have it set up um, already. We're ready for it, but I'm not going to uh, start doing those yet because I basically don't want to do that work right now. But toward the end of the year, we will have, uh, you can email us in whatever line you want to put in there. You can repeat one of the one that's already in there. If you're feeling creative, make one of your own as long as it fucking fits. Or we'll have a voicemail number. You can just fucking call in because no one knows how to send an MP3 in the goddamn email. So uh, call in, leave your line, and I will chop it up and make it sound super cool, better than my awful voice right now, which is already starting to go on me, if you couldn't tell. And we'll stick it in the intro. So the people who donate all get entered into the raffle. Uh, Subscribers get uh, a little thing in the intro. Does that pretty much make sense? Yeah, sounds good to me. So that means there's only one thing left to do before I can uh, take some NyQuil and uh, go back to sleep. Tacos. And that is, oh, fuck, I do need a taco really bad. Yeah, taco and NyQuil does not sound good together, no. though, does it? Right, but what I was referring to is uh, movies. We're doing some movies on yeah. the show next time. We're going to do a David Cronenberg thing. We're going to yeah. do Scanners and... Eastern Promises, which is new Cronenberg versus old sci-fi crazy Cronenberg. Yeah, so heavy show last week, little action show this week, and we'll just dive into a bunch of Cronenberg stuff next week. You know why we're doing the Cronenberg show? Is because last time we did a director-centric show. Darren Aronofsky. Yeah, I said, hey, did you like the director thing? What do you think? And no one emailed us about it. It's only when we say things like, where can we get tacos that people send? We get 100,000 emails. You would not believe the amount of emails. But no one left any feedback, which means that I assume everybody wants to hear another. They were busy centric. listening to that show, right? And didn't right. have time. to They were probably comment. bawling their eyes out after the Aronofsky show. Fucking a. So, uh, so we're gonna do another one of those again for David Cronenberg. And if you're not careful, you might learn something. Great. Watch more fucking film. Bye.